Salam from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani and you're watching Daily Debrief. It's a packed show today and on the show we're talking about who gains from sabotaging gas pipelines between Russia and Europe, why the Israeli police provide cover for extremist intrusions into the Al-Aqsa Mosque complex, and why the United States of America is unable to meet its own targets for admitting refugees. In a dramatic escalation, Seismologists reported explosions around the two parallel Nord Stream pipelines that European leaders, including the head of the EU, Ursula von der Leyen, and the Danish and Swedish governments, have said sabotage is the likely cause for. Russia says it's not ruling out any of, uh, of the options either. Nord Stream 1 suffered two leaks, northeast of the Danish island of Bornholm, while Nord Stream 2 was damaged south of Dweode, a beach located on the island's southernmost tip. The energy aspect of the Russia-Ukraine war is increasingly important as both a negotiating tool and even a potential means to an end to the conflict, given that Ukraine's military is functioning largely on European and, of course, American money. So the question that naturally arises is if these two pipelines are rendered nothing more than scrap metal at the bottom of the Baltic Sea, who stands to benefit and who, of course, will face the most serious impact? I spoke to Newsclick Editor-in-Chief Prabir Bukayasa to figure that part out. To be first up, uh, the leaders of the EU as well as the Prime Ministers or the heads of government of Denmark and Sweden uh, are calling these acts of sabotage. So who, who in this case would be the saboteurs and what, what, uh, how are you viewing what is going on exactly at, uh, or under the sea? Well, since neither they nor we have any evidence who are the saboteurs, you are only getting into conjectures who benefits as uh, the argument would be. Who benefits most from the crime? Now, if you take the uh, obvious issue that the two countries which have the most to benefit from the crime would be the United States, because they have been asking for a complete embargo on all Russian gas to be used by the EU. And of course, Ukraine, who also would like the gas to be stopped completely. Of course, no, nothing was flowing to Nord Stream 1 or 2 at the moment. Nord Stream 1 was essentially something which the Germans were willing to buy from, but Russia had actually stopped it, saying that the, uh, the turbines are not working, maintenance problems are there, sanctions are there for the for Siemens to really uh, service those turbines and so on. So Nord Stream 1 was in, a, in that way a bit of a uh, suit right now. But Russia had also said Nord Stream 2, they could supply it anytime they want. And all that Germany has to say is yes. It's also true the pressure has been building up in Germany. In fact, the vice president of their parliament had also said that uh, we, should, we should not wait for winter and our economy to collapse. We should already start Nord Stream 2 so that we can get adequate gas. And that was uh, Russia's offer that yes, Nord Stream 2 was, is in trouble technically, but Nord Stream 1, sorry, Nord Stream 1 is in trouble. One is in trouble, yeah. Nord Stream 2, we have the ability, there are no sanctions because they're all uh, Russian uh, turbines and compressors, so we can supply through Nord Stream 2. Mm. And it's a fully pressurized pipe. So therefore, it does appear that it is completely counterintuitive to argue that it is Russia who sabotaged the pipeline because that is their only source of pressure right now on the European Union and particularly Germany, which is the linchpin of the European Union sanctions at the moment. And right. then to lose, lose that leverage for no particular reason. I've heard conspiracy theories that somehow Putin did not want to get deposed, therefore he caused the sabotage. These are actually very, very fanciful. So I would go by it, uh, the old fashioned principle, who benefits. And in this case, obviously, the US was most interested in continuing EU, EU sanctions, particularly German sanctions, are not buying gas from uh, Russia. And of course, Ukraine is involved, but there's also another interesting sideline, which somebody has written about, Larry Johnson, he again is somebody who's been writing on this issue. Uh, he said, well, you know, the Polish uh, Baltic pipeline just started this on the same day. So his argument is, of course, Poland could also be a party to it. Again, the amount of uh, gas flowing into Poland from the 
uh, pipeline that has started is only a small amount compared to what Nord Stream 1 and 2 can do. So mm. I don't see that as a major issue, really. It's not a competition to Nord Stream 1 or 2 in terms of capacities. It's just about supplies Polish needs. So I still would find it difficult to understand who would be involved in the in the sabotage, except it does seem the US, the UK, of course, also has a capability. Uh, these are two parties who don't need uh, your gas from Russia. So right. they could have an interest in it. Mm. I don't really see anybody else who has a stake in sabotage the pipeline. But if you look at the sequence of events, and that's the mm. other interesting part. One explosion takes place at 2 a.m. or so, but thereabouts in the morning. Other one takes in the evening at about 8 p.m. or so. So it is not something which is therefore unplanned. It seems to have been planned, and it seems that the same set of saboteurs could be involved moving from one side to the other. That's what the logical uh, interpretation would be. And the Nord Stream uh, 1, of course, does not contain much gas. The pressure is low. But Nord Stream 2 is a pressurized pipeline. Pressurized pipeline. With a lot of gas. And uh, of course, that once these pipelines have been sabotaged at the level that they have, it's mm. really uh, 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 virtually at the bottom of the sea. Of course, it's a shallow sea. So it's not a, it's not a deep uh, sea, ocean or sea. But it's still, it's, uh, it's repair is not going to be something that's easy, even right. if there is no war. Yeah. Uh, it is uh, Europe's energy supplies and security, as well as, of course, the impact that it's having on uh, consumers and people who are facing a massive cost of living crisis, Prabir, uh, is going to worsen before it gets better. That much is clear. Uh, but it's also probably going to be a decisive factor in uh, that war that you were mentioning and, and how long it continues. What's the larger picture uh, on that front? Again, the question of war really depends on both the sides having the will to fight. And as of now, NATO is willing to pump weapons into Ukraine, is willing to support its falling economy, and Russia is willing to fight, and Ukraine is also willing to fight. So I don't see any massive change in the scenario. In fact, what could have happened is if the winter really comes, where the heating needs go up of the people, and the, they run out of stored gas, which is the, the argument is they have about two, two and a half months of stored gas, after which they have to face winter without uh, stored gas. And the regular supply of LNG is not going to be enough to keep Germany and other European countries warm. So given that, uh, there was the pressure and maximum pressure to be faced by Germany, cold and also dependent on uh, Russian gas. So the fact that they are going to be under pressure means that the economy is also going to be under pressure because German industry would also come to a halt. High prices of gas and high prices of electricity, which I've discussed earlier. So Germany was the one which could break ranks. And that was the fear which was there. And it is true during this winter, we are going to see large, uh, large scale problems for uh, Western Europe and also for the United Kingdom. Because of the price of electricity, we've discussed it earlier, why this is, to some extent it's an artificial crisis, but nevertheless, given the way the grid behaves, the bulk of the responsibility for paying the high cost of gas and the high cost of electricity, which is not why it should have, it should have been like that, because after all, gas only supplies about 10, 12% of German electricity. Right. But the way the grid is structured, the pie price gets fixed to the price of gas. Mm. Now, given that, the European people are going to face, particularly Germany, are going to face a difficult winter. And the industry is going to face a very difficult scenario. A lot of them have stopped working already because the cost of electricity is too high, particularly for industries which need a lot of electricity. So given that, you know, the pressure that is going to mount on the German economy, other, other European countries. So I don't see a way out at the moment for them. And it does seem there is going to be, to some extent, the de-industrializing, industrialization we're going to see in Western Europe. What, how the people will react? What are the long-term political implications? We don't know. 
But sabotaging a pipeline is an escalation of the war. And we should not only think of the economic implications, because if you are physically willing to up the ante, and that's what a sabotage of the gas pipeline means, mm -hmm. that is really a physical act of war. Yeah. And this is a physical act of war against Russian uh, asset, which is the uh, the two pipelines. Pipelines. Asset. So this is a very a dangerous point because if Russia also escalates, what is escalation going to be? Response to is going to be is a difficult question to answer. But mm. it's very very unlikely that they will have no response. Mm. So because after all, if you yeah. allow your assets to be attacked like this. And you see, common assets for everybody are at risk because after all, pipelines do go over oceans, transatlantic cables go over oceans. The, the, till date, the argument is we don't touch it even during war because mm. both are vulnerable. But right. if you break the taboo, then yeah. it's all it's better a dangerous escalation. All right. Thank you very much for your time today, Prabir. Ultra-nationalist Israeli settlers on Tuesday for the third day running entered the Al-Aqsa Mosque in occupied East Jerusalem. They were backed by Israeli police and other government forces and performed prayers inside the mosque compound. Several Palestinians have been injured during these intrusions and many more arrested, while access to the complex was largely blocked off to Palestinians. The mosque is a powerful symbol of the Palestinian resistance and as the Jewish New Year passes and Yom Kippur approaches, those on the ground fear more such violent incursions will follow. Abdul Rahman has all the details. Abdul, at a time that is uh, a time of celebration, I guess, a time of some prayer and uh, I suppose doing things with your closest and your dearest, uh, instead this group of ultra-nationalists is choosing a very sort of uh, violent and aggressive uh, approach to things. And it's not something new either. Um, we, we've seen uh, we've seen this becoming almost a serial uh, sort of practice now. Uh, wh what is the latest you're hearing, and how 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 are you? What are the reports coming in from the ground? Uh, as for the reports from the ground, the Israeli security forces uh, were basically attacking the Palestinians again uh, uh, yesterday night. Uh, that is the latest uh, we know about. Uh, and they have barricaded, as it is already reported, the, uh, the different parts of the old uh, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and they are not, they were not allowing uh, the Palestinians to move, to go to Al-Aqsa and pray there. Uh, uh, only the uh, people who were above Koti, that uh, some reports argue that only they were allowed to go. Uh, some of them are saying that even they were not uh, uh, allowed to go and pray. Meanwhile, uh, the, the ultra-nationalist uh, settlers primarily who have been campaigning for a very long time to basically uh, something against the Al-Aqsa Mosque. They have questioned the, uh, the religious sanctity uh, uh, of the mosque itself, uh, basically moving uh, inside the compound freely, uh, uh, decorating the uh, the religious uh, symbols and religious uh, uh, sanctity of the uh, compound, uh, dancing uh, provocative uh, provocative way, uh, and all those things are already there were happening uh, until uh, very recently. Uh, apart from that, there are also reports of kind of uh, these uh, settlers also attacking. Uh, uh, the Palestinians who have been allowed to go in and pray uh, on some occasions. We saw the video uh, from Monday in which one of the elder, elder elderly uh, Palestinian worshipper was pushed by uh, uh, a, a crowd which basically consists of Israeli uh, security forces and these uh, settlers. We have also seen visuals from the uh, uh, mosque compound in which we see Israeli security forces provocatively pushing and uh, asking the people who are already inside, Palestinians who are already inside to vacate the premises. Uh, so all these things are happening and this is nothing new. We have seen it happening many times in the past. Uh, 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 particularly, it reminds 
uh, what happened last year uh, uh, during the month of Ramadan when hundreds of Palestinians were injured and arrested during similar attacks uh, by the Israeli security forces and the extremist ultranationalist uh, Jewish settlers. Uh, given sort of the kind of backing that uh, these uh, extremists have, it's fairly clear that they have, uh, I mean, state sanctions, so it's not, it can't be regarded as the actions of just a, a small fringe, right? It's very much a sort of, uh, and, and again, the, the, the number of occasions on which these incidents are taking place, uh, it is sort of almost seeming like it's part of the policy. It is. Uh, if you see, uh, see, at this moment, we can say that there is uh, an election coming and uh, the, the right uh, government in Israel do not want to antagonize these, uh, their potential voters. So, of course, that, that thinking is up, it's still there. The, uh, unfortunately, Israel is in election for last, for last two and a half years. This is yeah. the fifth uh, election coming. So, uh, so the incidents uh, which uh, Times of Israel also reports have increased. Uh, the, the repeated attacks on Al-Aqsa has increased tremendously in the last few years. One of the reasons, of course, is the popular uh, 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 need of allowing such uh, extremists to kind, of, uh, 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 to kind of garner votes. So... Uh, Israeli state in general is not expected to allow such uh, uh, movements of extremist Jews, uh, allowing them to pray inside, to do all kinds of rituals inside. That is not allowed at all. As per the 1967-68 agreement with Jordanian, uh, the, the, the Jews are only allowed to visit the, temp, uh, to, uh, to the mosque uh, as a tourist. Uh, it, they can pray, but pray outside the mosque compound. Uh, so it is allowed primarily because, of course, there's an uh, element of appeasement which is there. But apart from that, uh, I think this will be very, uh, it will be a simplification to see it only as an appeasement. It is also a structural uh, attempt to change the facts on the ground. Uh, 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 continuous regular alliance, this also leads to uh, different kinds of uh, legal uh, cases uh, in the Israeli courts. And we have seen that in last two, three years, Israeli courts have, have gone on and off on the rights of Jews to pray inside the mosque compound. So this deliberate attempt to create confusion about the status of the compound uh, on, on the one side and uh, uh, allowing physical uh, intrusions inside uh, the compound on the other side should be seen together as, a, as an attempt to uh, change the facts on the ground, to basically uh, uh, gradually uh, uh, kind of uh, create grounds for uh, expropriation of the Palestinian uh, uh, land. But uh, uh, it will not be easy, of course. We have seen uh, that this is also today, by the way, is the uh, uh, 22nd anniversary of the Second Intifada when uh, Ariel Sharon, former Prime Minister of Israel, tried to do the similar provocation in 2000 visited the mosque compound, which led to uh, a mass uprising all across the uh, Palestine. Uh, 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 Hamas and other uh, Arab countries, uh, including the Arab League, have warned of similar cons consequences if Israel continues uh, to uh, try this uh, uh, attempted uh, change of the status quo. So uh, I think uh, there is also a kind of we can see what is happening in Al-Aqsa as a, as a case study of what has happened to the Palestinians uh, since 1967. Gradual attempt to expropriate and uh, a fierce resistance from the Palestinians. Right. Thanks for putting that in a very clear picture and perspective, Abdul. And finally, the US government's budget year comes to a close at the end of this week. And President Joe Biden has said his administration will keep the target for admitting refugees into the country at 125,000 per year. Activists and advocates for refugees have been clamoring for an increase and demanding the US do much more, particularly given its role in conflicts and other conditions leading to mass displacement around the world. The other interesting part of the story is that the government has failed to come anywhere close to meeting this target. 
only about 20% of that 125,000 number were admitted in the 11 months leading up to the end of August this year. Anish Radhakrishnan covers the region for People's Dispatch and joins us for more. Anish, uh, why is the Joe Biden administration finding it so difficult to meet its own targets for the number of refugees it uh, allows to admit or it admits into uh, the US? Well, uh, part of that and what the White House often gives as a reason for uh, the low intake of refugees is the fact that the refugee resettlement system, the entire machinery was essentially dismantled under the Trump administration to the point where more than a third of uh, these refugee centers were closed down. Uh, uh, many, of the, uh, many of the workers were uh, let go because there were not many people to, uh, to take in because a large part of the efforts were put under the Trump administration at least, uh, were put to uh, detain and deport the asylum seekers rather than take them in. Now, the thing is that while the Biden administration did hike the refugee cap, uh, it did barely anything to actually make it easier for that many refugees to enter. So it's pretty much staying at the same level that the Trump administration's, basically it's about 20, 25,000 uh, per annum. Uh, and that's the cap that, uh, that is pretty much where the levels of refugee admission is happening right now in the United States. And on top of that, uh, there was also the whole thing about the U.S. focusing a large part of its efforts to rehabilitate whatever uh, political refugees in uh, focusing more specifically on Ukraine and Afghanistan because obviously it has political scores to, uh, scores to make in those countries. And so it pretty much focused much of its efforts and resources into rehabilitating refugees from those countries rather than a large number of refugees that do come from across the border or uh, even uh, in, from other parts of the world. So it's pretty much 100 and uh, the figures uh, estimate something like around 180,000 people were put under what is called as uh, humanitarian parole. And that itself uh, shows that the US is definitely capable of uh, making things happen and making um, admission- Being not uh, quickly as well. Exactly, exactly. It happened. In a span of a very, a very short period of time, in fact, uh, with at least 100,000 of these being just from Ukraine. And mm. that shows that the capabilities exist, but it's just that the US, the Biden administration has done very, very little, almost nothing in many ways, to actually make sure that the refugee admission system is rebuilt or at least brought to working capacity. So, so clearly, at least the capability is there, but the political will is lacking. Uh, and now with global numbers of those displaced for various reasons, uh, conflict being, of course, uh, prime among them, uh, having reached over 90 million, and the US being uh, the richest country in the world and able to deploy the kind of resources that it can, uh, I guess the question is, shouldn't they be doing more? Even this cap that the Biden administration calls ambitious, uh, uh, is only 125,000. It's a very small fraction of the global number of people looking for refuge. Yes, definitely. I mean, one part of one way to look at it is the fact that a large number of these conflicts that we're talking about that has displaced millions, tens of millions of people around the world has uh, more or less something to do with the United States to begin with. So mm -hmm. there is definitely a greater responsibility on the part of the United States to actually make sure that its refugee uh, admission system work, but that is not happening. We very recently talked about this whole Republican uh, Democrat conflict uh, over refugee admissions uh, and my immigrant uh, entry in uh, Texas and the whole bus thing that were where you had migrants being busted into uh, New York City and Washington DC. But uh, if you look at the very uh, nuances of things, uh, it's the differences between the two factions is very very little to the point that it's uh, very uh, difficult to actually pinpoint where they it's just the part it's just the rhetoric part that they are uh, that you right will see any kind of distinction and it shows that uh, any effort because Biden administration has been criticized time and again for falling short in making any efforts to uh, deliver on 
whole host of campaign promises that it had uh, brought up uh, before coming to power. And uh, and this uh, and refugee admission is just one of them. Even the 125,000, which is pre-Trump uh, uh, era kind of refugee admission numbers, at the time when uh, global displacement and refugee numbers were also low, much lower than what we did what we have today uh, is well, it's call it trying to call it, as you said trying to call it ambitious even though there are actual social workers on the ground who say that this is really not enough and this needs to be uh, amended to the uh, to actually cater to the real needs where large number of refugees are trying to uh, resettle and find uh, refuge in the United States and this. Uh, again, this is uh, all part of the very lack of uh, political will or any kind of will to be to begin with by uh, the part of the Biden administration to actually make efforts to make things smoother and you know workable rather than uh, actual lacking of resources or uh, you know machinery to begin with. Right. So as things stand, the can is just kicked down uh, to. Ne the next financial year and, and we'll see what efforts may or may not be made but indicators are that uh, pretty much very little uh, focus yeah there all right thanks very much anish for that update that brings this episode of daily debrief to a close as always thank you very much for watching for more details on these stories uh, and all of the other work we do head over to our website peoplesdispatch.org and don't forget to follow us on the social media platform of your choice Thanks again for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye.